morning for the privilege of being called children of God. Yes. You have a plan for our lives, and Lord, you have provided us, uh, provided us with the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Hallelujah. And thank you for the inspired word of God this morning. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. And the title is the kind of tree that we ought to be like. An olive tree, a green olive tree. Why are we to be compared with a green olive tree? This is what we are going to find out in a moment. If you uh, look at this uh, Psalm 52 and the first, the following slide, we will look at the title and we will start to, to get into it. The title tells us that this is written to the choir master. So it's uh, inspired, it's like a special message to Brother Stephen, uh, Brother Chris, to the ones who lead us in worship and lead the, the choir and the worship in the church. There's a special uh, message uh, to the choir master, a maskil of David. What is a maskil? It means a sacred or inspired song with an instruction. Uh, this word occurs 13 places in the Psalms as a title, like a title of so and so. And six times the masculines are from David. And they are in many consecutive Psalms, like 42 to 45, 52 to 55, 88, 89. These are masculines that are being mentioned as titles. And we can see here, this is a, we will see this morning, this is a very short, this is a very short uh, Psalms, only eight, eight verses. But even short Psalms have a lot to teach us concerning the character of God, His love, His justice, and how God is going to deal with the pride and the sinfulness and the evil of man. And I remember when I began to minister in China and the countryside as missionary in the early 90s, I saw how the Chinese leaders were using songs to, to, uh, to teach the truths of the Bible because many in the countryside in those years were illiterate. So how could they read the Bible and know the content of the Bible? They couldn't really so they used songs. I remember one time I was in Henan province and they were telling the life of Abraham in a long song. Everything about the life of Abraham from when he was called to the time when, you know, Isaac was born and his, his adventure of faith and Isaac and all this. Everything was in, in a song. It was a long song. And in Ainan Island, I've seen the same thing later on. They use songs to, to bring events, uh, doctrines, truths, and the people of the Bible. So the people knew a lot of the Bible, even though they had not read the Bible because they had songs. So here we have a masculine of David. To David, even to tell the story of a man's wickedness, because this is what we are going to talk about here, telling the story of a man's wickedness can be turned into an inspired song of instruction for you and for me. You know, this is the story of a bad man. And he tells that story and turns it into an inspired an inspired uh, teaching from the Bible for all of us, something that we will be able to learn. And why is it that many Psalms are based upon personal experience and includes a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions that are very, very strong? Why is it? It's, it's so that you and I, we will be able to identify our human personal emotions and experience to those that wrote these kind of psalms. So that the Bible does not only represents an old book, a historical book, something that we cannot relate to, but that this feeling, how David felt into this particular psalms, you and I, we can know, I have similar feeling. Me too, I'm going through crisis. And me too, sometimes I'm angry and I'm fearful and I'm in doubts and I don't know if uh, I feel weak in my faith and I, 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 I'm confused about the resources of God, the promises of God. How am I going to, to react? I'm thinking of the future. I feel insecure about the future. I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. And we turn to these 
math skills, these songs of instructions, and the Holy Spirit is going to use it to tell us something, to quiet our hearts, to put our trust in the Lord. And this is why we have these wonderful songs. And uh, David here, and this text here, is become a victim. He's become a persecuted. He is surrounded with enemies. He is a fugitive. If you have seen the movie, The Fugitive, a few years ago, he's a runaway. People are looking for him. The king ordered, if you find this man, if you see him anywhere, you must tell me so that I'm going to bring my police and I'm going to go after him. And you know, in today's generation, we still have many countries and many people who are facing the same kind of situation. We have some who are in our church here. Uh, they are seeking for uh, asylum here in Hong Kong. They, are, they have run away from their country because sometimes they are on the wrong side of the last uh, vo uh, the president who has been elected or something. And if they, uh, their name is given, if they are told where it is, the police will come to their home and will kidnap them and maybe they will not see them again. So what we read there is happening today. For some of them it's very real, they are here in this room. But for some others, we all have crisis in our lives. We all have some surprise tragedy in our lives, like things that we cannot handle. This is really, 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 really bad things happening in our lives. Do you think that life is fair and just? How many agree with me that life is often unfair and unjust? Yes. yes? Not many of you? you, you know? Are you believing, yes or not? Is life fair or unfair? Many times it's unfair. Is it God's fault? No. Whose fault is that? Yes. Sinfulness. Sinfulness has entered this world and maybe many people like the one that we are going to talk about in a few minutes is, is, is taking control over many of the uh, circumstances of our lives and make our lives miserable. So here we have in the intro of that uh, masculine, we have a beginning of the background. This is about when Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. And if you are not sure what I'm talking about, this story and details, you can find it in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and 22. This is a real story. And it goes like this. David was on the run from King Saul. Uh, King Saul had kind of lost his marbles. And uh, he was crazy and he was jealous and uh, envious and fearful of the success of David and he, 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 he threatened his life. So David had to run away. He was almost uh, uh, killed by, uh, twice by spears that was thrown, thrown onto him. So he ran away and while he was fleeing he didn't know where to turn. So he went, he did what probably some of us would have done. He went to the city of Nob where the priest, the priestly city was, he went, he went to the temple and he went to the priest, uh, Haimelech, and he asked him for bread. Well, I'm running away, I have nothing, I have nothing to, to defend myself, I have nothing to feed myself on, so do you have any bread? So the priest didn't know anything, had never heard that David was a fugitive at this point, so he helped him, because David was a, some kind of a hero at this point, with all of his uh, military campaign and everything. So he gave him some bread, and David asked for Goliath's sword, and was given to him. But while he was there, Doeg the Edomite was also just happened to be there physically. Who is Doeg? Doeg was the chief shepherd of King Saul. It's kind of the right hand, a very important person who has access to the king. He was in charge. Uh, he, he was kind of a trustworthy uh, assistant for the king because he was put in charge of all of his sheep and all of his cattle and everything. So that's a very high position at the time. It's like the general manager of his uh, finance or something in today's term. So, but the the egg was in the temple at this time, and he, he saw Ahimelech giving the sword and bread to David. So then he quickly went to the king and reported to him. And uh, immediately after that, King Saul called the, the priest to come and was so furious. 
Why didn't you tell me that my enemy David was with you? Why did you help him to run away? You are against me. So he ordered his soldiers to kill them. Of course, no soldiers would ever touch their hand uh, over the, to, to hurt any priest. But Doeg the Edomite was ordered to kill each one of them, 85 priests who were innocent. And it was not enough to commit this evil. He went to the priestly city of Nob and he killed all the women and all the children and he burned the city and he killed all the animals. So that's the story, okay? So that is when David is writing an inspired song of instruction based on one of the worst the, the most evil story that you can even imagine. So how would you write about it? If, if it would be your situation you're in, you're a fugitive, you witness, and then you feel that you are kind of part of, the, the, of this old thing, this drama, because when David went to the, the, the priest, he did not tell him all the, the truth. He did not tell him, hey, I'm running away from King Saul. He, he hid this part. He just asked for help. So he was kind of a little bit like part of the problem and then by hiding. So that these priests have been accused of treason and were killed because David hid something to them. So, so how imagine the turmoil of David, how he felt his emotions. And imagine yourself in the worst ever crisis of your life. Maybe you have not even met your worst crisis yet. It may be coming ahead of time. Because each and every one of us in this, this room here, without exception, we are facing crisis. We all have our crisis. You know, on Sunday morning, we meet here, we shake hands, we smile. But sometimes our heart is not really ready to smile, but we still smile. We, we hide the trouble. We hide the problems. We, we hide the fight we just had with our husband. Uh, we hide, hide the, the fear that we have and the concerns we have about the, 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 the finances that is ahead. We, we hide about the trouble back home that our children or our grandchildren is having. We hide these things because this is private. This is personal to us. But each person in this room, we have a private life. We have our own problem, our own set of problems, our own pressures. It's all different, but if we take time to sit and listen to each other's story, we will all hear some pretty, sometimes surprising stories. I remember when a few years ago, when we did the many semesters of the uh, uh, Evangelism Explosion, and lesson number three, the students have to write their testimonies. And many of the sisters, and you included here, you, you wrote a testimony and I was the one to read and to correct it and to improve your testimony so that when you would evangelize, you would use it. And sometimes I would read the story says, wow, I never been in a crisis like that before, like earthquakes, uh, horrible things that happen. You know, like I was this, I, I was eight years old and this horrible situation happened to me and I was a teenager and this happened to me. And I was discovering the story of sisters who come to church every Sunday and look normal, <laughs> act normal and smile like everybody else, but with horrible sometimes dark past that would make anybody you know lose their, their their mind and and all of us we have or we are or we will face horrible crises at some point in our lives like things that we don't know how to get out of that situations where we we don't have resources we don't know what to do and all this so David is in that situation but David is so special that he succeed to turn his horrible crisis into an inspired message of the Holy Spirit to instruct us hundreds of years later to as when we are going to go through our own crisis, we have an example. We have something to learn from him. It's so dark. It's so bad. But then he turns it into a wonderful uh, fate to, for, for us uh, today. Amen?
So that's what we are going to do uh, this morning. So verse 1 to 4, we will see quickly how he describes this doeg, this action, his character. And uh, doeg, he says, why do you boast? And look at this text and pay attention to all the words that relates to his word, to his mouth, something that he says. He boasts. He boasts of evil. How can someone boast of evil? If you want to boast of something, boast of your good achievement, boast of your goodness. Don't boast of killing innocent people, of burning a city, of killing children. Don't boast of, of that. Why do you boast of evil, almighty oh man? And, and then he talks about his tongue. It's like a sharp razor. He's a worker of deceit. He uses word to deceive. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. And don't be surprised, but in your lifetime, and maybe you already have, but in your lifetime you will meet people who can use their mouth to destroy you. They can use your mouth, their mouth to, to destroy your reputation so that they can progress uh, climb the ladder of success or move you away, destroy your reputation. So it's going to happen. You know, today in our generation, Doeg is dead. He, he died in this generation. But the devil still has other Doeg. That they, they are repeating the same thing to, against you, against God's people today. And if you look at this text, you will see an amazing contrast. You see the horrible uh, statement, why do you boast of evil? And the steadfast love of God endures all the day, or for every day, for all of our life. And so this is the, the statement, I think, that starts this. In the midst of the most horrible crisis, you and I must see that must recognize that the love of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God lasts forever. It lasts, it's beyond time. And we must see the love of God as our anchor, our hope, our strength, what will carry us through these horrible situations of our lives. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And then from verse 5 to 7, we, will, we see here uh, what, how David pictures the justice of God. Uh, he sees in advance what God was going to do to this evil man. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away, pluck you out of your dwelling place, uproot you from the land of the living. So this is what's going to happen. It's going to be destroyed. And... Um, he, he, he trusts not in the Lord, but he, he made his success in life in destroying people. He, be, he becomes rich. He gains authority. He gets closer to the king. He, he, he goes upper in society status by doing evil. Not by deserving, not by his talents, but just by being cunning in, in this way. And then we read that the righteous will see the fall of the wicked. And this is something that we need to realize many times in the Bible. You will have this picture. Think uh, the book of Esther. Mordecai. Uh, Amen. Amen had succeeded very well to go to the Supreme Court and passed a law for the destruction and the extermination of all the people of Israel. I mean, this is a big achievement. This man was evil. If you want to talk evil, you have the champion of evil. Amen. A whole nation, imagine, it's like a genocide. He succeed to have a genocide stamped and approved by the Supreme Court. I mean, this, you need to be good. You need to be good with your words to succeed, to, to, to cheat people into that. And he succeeded. But at the end of the book, you see that Mordecai is still standing and he looks at the gallows where Haman is being hanged himself. The gallows that he built himself. And this is, you know, we have to know God. We have to see how people, evil, prosper. But it will prosper for, for a while. But from generation to generation, the love, the mercy of God, divine justice lasts. Because God is eternal. The, his, his standards 
will go over the, the lifetime of this, of this man. If you look at the Holocaust, many of the old criminal are still being pursued today. Some of them succeeded to live until 80, 90 years old, but they are still being tracked. Can you, you imagine that they can enjoy their life? They have lived in hiding, they changed their personality, they changed their life story, they changed everything. They're just hid with their big fortune uh, in some country like in Brazil or in Argentina. They've been, you know, living there in hiding for their life. Was it, is it a good life? away from their family, tore apart and everything, and all the, the memories. It must have been hell to, to live their, their life. And they are still tracked down and still brought to, to the, the tribunal. So there is, a, there is a justice, but not as fast as you and I would like. Somebody hurt you today, you want him to be to court tomorrow or next month. You want this situation to be resolved. But with God, it's not necessarily. But David, notice here in this, in this uh, story, this masculine, this song of instruction, that when David wrote it, his situation had not changed. He's still a fugitive. He's still running. But now he has all this painful, uh, tragic event to carry in his emotion and his heart. People who helped him. The whole city has been destroyed. So you can imagine the, the turmoil that he is in. You know, this man who tracked David is King Saul. At the end, David goes on the battlefield and pick up the shield and pick up the weapons of King Saul who died on the battle. David is not dead. The one Saul was tracking David to kill him, but at the end, Saul dies on the battlefield, but David is still alive, and he picks him, and he honors his memory in all of this. How many times David could have killed this man, this enemy? He had his, his chance, but he did not. You know, in verse 6, it says, The righteous also shall see and fear. The righteous is different from the evil man. The righteous fear. The righteous has the knowledge of God. The righteous don't, don't play God. The righteous has the mind of the good man, of the righteous. It turns to God and trusts in the providence of the Lord. What do we read more? What, what more do we read about this man, Gdoeg? He promoted himself to destroying others with lies. In verse 7, here is the man who did not make God his strength. You know, all of us will die one day. And if you are buried in the cemetery, you will have a, a, a tombstone. And an epitaph will be written on this one. This is uh, Brother Roy Garcia, born this year, died this year. He was such and such and such a man, okay? But uh, don't worry, it's not a prophecy, I hope, you know? <laughs> Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, I'm just an example. You know, just be careful about doing these kind of things. Okay. I believe you will live a long life, brother. <laughs> brother Roy. But all of us will have something that will describe the, some characteristic of us that, will, that has impacted our, our life story that people r r r remind us about. And they will say, this is this kind of woman that this kind of man is. And this is what is written of this man. Here is a man who did not make God his strength. That's not really, really good, isn't it? And this is uh, the epitaph of this man. And then contrast verse 8 and 9, and this is where we are going to finish uh, with. Verse 8 and 9 is so, such a wonderful text. Because I want to stress again, imagine the emotions of David. Keep in mind the, the turmoil that he must have been fighting with violent thought, like anger, like desire of vengeance. And this is horrible. If I see him, I'm going to kill him. And if I get a chance to get my hands on the neck of Saul, the king who ordered this massacre, I'm going to kill him. That, that's normal human emotion. Instead, he writes a mass kill. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, song of instructions, something he has learned 
from that and he pass it on to us today. That's what he is doing. What a great contrast. In the midst of this horrible, evil, wicked man and everything that he has done, but I am like a green olive tree. And then you say, what? What? Why does he compare himself to a green olive tree flourishing in the house of God? I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. And I will hope in your name, for your name is good. Wow. Remember that both Doeg and David were in the temple at the same time. But according to what we wrote, uh, read in verse 5 to 7, Doeg is going to be destroyed, he's going to be uprooted, he's going to be removed from God's blessing and from God's temple and from God's presence. But David is going to be restored. But at the moment of this writing, David is not yet restored into the temple. He's still a fugitive. He's still running away from the temple. He's running away. He has no place to land and to, to be secure. But he says, I am like a green olive tree. And what does it mean? Planted in the court of the, the, the temple. Even though I am running for my life, even though my enemies are tracking me down, my life is in danger, I am like a green olive tree. And the green here is not really important, the color, red or green, but the green represents life. You know, if you look at the plant, a tree, herbs, anything, a flower, if it's healthy, it's green. If it's well uh, watered, it's green. Uh, if there is uh, some bugs eating it, you can tell. If there is a disease in the plant, you can tell it's yellow, it's rusty, it's falling apart, uh, or, or you can see the, it's, the branches are, are dried. It's green, so it means it's, it's healthy. Even though it's like dead, uh, are all around him, people are against him. He feels that his life is flourishing, that God is on his side, and that he will go on with his life and fulfill the plan that God has for his life. Life is not over until it's over. Is that right? God is still with you. So I am a green olive tree. And there is a symbolism that is often used in the Bible compared uh, people or the blessing of God with trees. And I will give you some, just a few examples. Uh, Psalm 128 verse 3 and 4 about the blessing of God compares to trees. And this is good for families here. Husband and wife, listen to that. It's good for you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like olive shoots surrounding your table. Isn't it wonderful that a wife is compared to a fruitful vine? She's bearing a lot of grapes and lots of children. And that is the blessing of God according to, uh, to, to the Bible. This is a blessing. I mean, in our generation, we think differently because our society is squeezing us into our mold. But, you know, today it's all about finances. It's all about the stress and work and career and my career and all this. But uh, go back to when these promises are being given. Actually, if life would be normal, because in our generation we're not living normal lives, if our lives would be normal, it would be okay to have many children. It would be normal to stay in our home. It would be normal to enjoy being a father, a mother, or children, and working around the farm, or working around town, or something, in a community where we, we grew up and we develop. But today, we, it's very difficult to, we, we, we think differently. But this is the blessing that God says that families, we, we ought to have. See how the man will be blessed who fears the Lord. You fear the Lord, your wife is a, fruitful vine and your children are green olive shoots like the, the green again and it's shoots it's young it's fresh it's strong it's healthy it runs all over the house and it brings joy into the family if you look at the next text psalm 92 verse 4 to 15 uh, i just put some, some parts of it you will see many similarities between psalm 92 and psalm 52 
Psalm 52 finish with the praise. I will always praise you for what you have done. But here it starts like that. Your mighty deeds, O Lord, make me glad. Because of what you have done, I sing for joy. Because God, what you have done. This is something a fool cannot understand. Fool cannot understand what the, the ways of God, the justice of God, the working of God over a lifetime. Because even us, sometimes we, we analyze our life based on the moment, the circumstance, the week, the day. But God sees our lifespan. He sees when we will die. He sees what He wants to achieve and accomplish because to God everything is eternal. But we turn it into so much materials and time limited. But God doesn't. So a fool cannot understand. What doesn't a fool understand? The wicked may grow like weeds. Those who do wrong may prosper. Yet they will be totally destroyed. Evil people prosper. Evil people will have their hour of glory and success. Evil people, dishonest people, can make money and be successful and reach the top. But I want you to continue to read and make a comparison between the weeds, the evil people here are compared to plants, weeds. And if you continue reading, we see verse 12, the righteous flourish like palm trees. It's wonderful how the palm trees in the Philippines and uh, the tropical uh, countries, it stands tall, it stands beautiful. Usually you look and you see the blue sky and the palm trees. and this, It's a symbol of strength, of success, of life. They will grow like cedars of Lebanon. Why cedars of Lebanon? In Lebanon, the, the, the slope, the mountain slopes, where the cedars of Lebanon are, are many times dry. It's not wet enough. So it's not land that uh, allows a lot of plants to grow. But this kind of tree, cedars of Lebanon, are trees that can survive and to hardship. They can grow strong and tall and to hardship. So that's good. The righteous are strong like palm trees. They are also tough, like cedars of Lebanon. They, they hold on there, even though it's dry, even though something is missing, the, the ground is not rich enough or watered enough, it still survives. Amen. Amen. So I want to be a, a, a cedar and, and a palm tree. Amen. They are like trees planted where? In the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord because they flourish in the temple of our God. Stay close to God. That's where you belong. And if you do, you will still bear fruit and old age and will always be green and strong. Because we're talking about green, we're talking about strong, we're talking about life. You can in old age continue on. And now look at the evil that prosper. They're compared to weeds. And look at the righteous, they're compared to some wonderful trees that last long. Weeds. In the Bible, when you talk about weeds, you talk about weeds or flowers grow for a season. In the spring, they, they start. In the fall, they die. That's to show normally how brief is the lifetime of human being. We compare it to weed. But in, con in contrast to that, we're talking about trees. Trees that can grow to hundreds of years. A long time, you cut it and then the shoots will, put, you cut its branch and it will continue to, to live. So there's a difference between the righteous who seek after God, who loves God, who hold on to God, trust in the Lord, because his life will continue to be green, will continue to grow. Even in old age, it will uh, continue. Amen? Amen? That's why David says, I am like an olive tree in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. David says, even though I'm running away from my life, I don't know what's going to happen to me. But I am confident I have a future. My life is not over. I will be like an, uh, a flourishing olive tree. I will continue to minister. I will continue to fulfill God's uh, purpose in my life. I will continue my life for God. You see... And this is here one of the dangers many Christians or non-Christians, when they face horrible crises like that and their heart is in turmoil, sometimes they cannot come back to grasp God, to see the big picture of the love of God sustaining them. It's not enough. 
and they walk away from God and they will you know drift away and lose their faith but David has uh, something to teach us this morning because he often referred to in the house of the Lord the the green olive tree is and the house of the Lord because it's under that's where it is under the care of God the protection of God the provision of God guarded by God protected by God and this is where we need to do to be and one thing you and I need to learn is to have David's desire and Psalm 27 verse 4 says one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to marvel, to understand more of, of the wonderful God that we have and to seek His guidance, to be guided by Him for my life. This is where I want to be. This is what I need in my life. This is what I want. And Christians who don't make it, it's because somewhere along the crisis of their life, they drift away and this desire will not be there anymore. I talked to someone this summer a lady that many of you knows and she says I don't want to be associated with Christianity anymore I don't want my child to be persecuted or to be looked at or something I prefer not to have anything to do she confessed the Lord she witnessed of the Lord she was baptized the Lord some of you know her she has been on mission field before what happened I don't have it. I don't feel it anymore. That's why David says, I, one thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I desire, I want to remain, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, regardless of what can happen in my life. That's where I'm going. That's what I want in my life. I was having a conversation with that person this summer, and I says, after she explained, uh, I didn't say anything, I just listened to, she felt that she needed to, she respected me enough to, to tell me about how she went away from the Lord. And I says, what about heaven? What about the promise of Jesus, the word of Jesus, is that true? Is there, is there an eternity? If there is an eternity, then there is no question asked. You, you cannot stop. You cannot stop. So along the way, if you don't dwell into the house, into the presence of the Lord, you lose the perspective that we learn and to this masculine, this song of instruction. That's why David finished so powerfully Listen to that, what David says in closing. He says, I am like a olive tree. And look at verse 9. For what you have done, I will always praise you. First of all, David should not have said normally, as a writer, I, I am a olive tree. He, sh he could have said, I will be. I believe that I will be. But he says, I am. And he should have said, for what you will do, I will praise you. But he says, for what you have done, I will praise you. And here's a very important lesson for all of us to learn. This is the most amazing declaration of faith in this psalm. While nothing has changed, while this horrible crisis is, while his heart is still in turmoil, in advance, he has the ability to foresee his future, the plan of God. In advance, he, apart from his present trouble, he sees further than that. He, uh, to him, his prayer has already been answered. God has already moved. The promise of God is already fulfilled. That's why he wrote this text. I am, not I will be. And I praise you for what you have done, not what you will be doing. And that is the most awesome uh, tes testimony of faith. And then Mark chapter 11, verse 24, you know this little verse that always astonished me. Uh, when you pray and you ask something to God, believe that it is accomplished and you will see it. Believe that it's already being done and you will see it accomplished. Faith is what? The conviction of what you don't see will take place. See, it's not yet the reality of the life. It's still the fugitive. But it's like he knows. 
I am uh, I'm continuing. God is with me. I am under God's care. Amen. So I will ask uh, uh, Ying and uh, Melrose to go to the music. Don't look at them. Just stay here because we are closing. We are going to go to prayer. They will just prepare for a song and we will, we will pray. You and I, we are the godly people of God. And this song is talking to us uh, godly. To the godly, we are being planted in the house of the Lord. L the Lord took us out of darkness and he planted us into the kingdom of the Lord. So you and I, we have our place in the kingdom. We have our place in the house of the Lord. And we will never be rooted from that. Psalm 52 is the, one of the most remarkable texts because David's faith show us his ability to see beyond the crisis. Stay here, stay here. David's faith sees beyond the crisis. He sees beyond the trouble. He sees beyond the evil people. He sees beyond what is so difficult for you to accept into your life. Do you have this ability to see beyond your crisis? How do you foresee your future? Do you see into your future and the future of your children? How many of us worry about our pension? Will we have enough money? About our job security? About the future of our children? Our health? We worry, we are afraid. David envisioned himself securely. Psalm 52 is an exercise of faith. It is your exercise of faith. It's written for, for you and for me. It's an exercise of your faith. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. <laughs>